morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church. Uh, it's great to see you guys all here today. Um, if you will, stand with me as you're able, and we're going to worship the Lord today. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church, and good morning online folks. Um, good morning real people. I mean, not real people. Oh, boy. Now I'm in trouble. Sorry, online people. Okay. Welcome. You have a bulletin. It has a communication card. If you're new with us, uh, please fill this out and put it in the offering boxes around the outside of the church. I have some helpers here, Mari and Scott Jr. You can see them now. Wave, wave your hand. Okay, so that's like the little box that I'm talking about. And you might not see them because they're kind of hidden, but there's multiple boxes around. So those are our offering boxes, and you just fill this out. And you get to know more about Grace Community Church. And if you haven't been here before, visit the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. On the back, there's a place for your prayer requests, and the pastoral team prays for that each week. So feel free to write on that as well. And it helps us with attendance. So if you're a member of Grace Community Church, Man, everything about this is just the tops. So a couple other announcements here in your bulletin. The books, we'll let, uh, we're going to skip that one. Jay's going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to look at youth group tonight is a movie night. So we, I, we have a lot of uh, people going to graduations and kind of going here and there. So we're, we're just going to kind of lay back and, and chill out. We're going to do a movie night. So the middle school, you'll still meet at 5 o'clock 
and um, the meal will happen after your movie, and then it can be picked up at 7.30. The high school is going to start with a meal at 6.30 and then finish out a movie at 8.45. Uh, so that will be cool. And then next week, Memorial Weekend, I'm going to be gone, so there will be no youth group next week. So that's not in the bulletin. That's just a little extra for you. Okay, VBS, that's the other thing. We're, we're starting to gather supplies for creating a Jerusalem marketplace. So you'll see listed in the bulletin things that we would love to borrow, but if, if we do borrow them from you, it sure helped to have them be labeled well so you get them back. So that's what that means, uh, to have that be labeled well. We're looking for particularly like those canopies, the outdoor canopies, if you have anything like that, um, that's going to help us set up this, this marketplace in the gym area. And then there's a bunch of other items there listed. So please take a look at that and see if you can help. And um, if you happen to have some tribal-style rugs in the car already, you can just drop those right off at the Welcome Center today. Um, okay, volunteer meeting, June 5th. If you are helping with VBS after church on June 5th, we will have a, a meeting to continue developing what we need to do. So if you've signed up to volunteer, that's a meeting for you. I ask your continued prayer for the youth uh, mission trip as we're getting ready to go to Lake Charles, Louisiana. Things are falling into place, and so we're just thankful to God for the ways that... Um, He's provided for that, and also, you know, just making mention again, uh, that f fundraiser at Freddy's uh, was, was successful. I got back uh, to the owner there, and he, he said that the check is on, on its way, so that's awesome, and we're just thankful for, for, for that. Um, you can see at the Welcome Center, there's a sign-up for the Women's of Grace, Women's, Women of Grace. They'll be meeting um, at the library for live life in full bloom so you don't want to live life in not full bloom you want to be in full bloom and this is the time for it so i think it has to do with beautifying uh some of the the flower pots and th things and that's going to be at the library uh great bend library so not the church library okay value them both community-wide informational meeting that's been on there for for a while uh, it's going to be happening here it's a it's a community meeting. Uh, anybody from Great Bend who's interested can come June 1st at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have David Beecham. Right. Right. David Beecham. Okay. I think that's all I have for the news information. Pass over Pastor Jay. Okay. Well, I am excited to talk to you about this next topic because it's something that we've been kind of working on in our spare time where we can, and we're sort of finally up and running. And I know I've talked to you about this before, but we, uh, w our library was not really getting good use. And when we look back over books that have been checked out, the only books that were being checked out were fiction. Um, and then we had all of these good and not some not so good uh, nonfiction titles that weren't really being taken advantage of as kind of a hodgepodge. And so what we did was we slowly got and gave, got rid of, gave way to various places, the books that were in there other than the beloved fiction section. And, uh, and we turned the, this into now a kind of library slash bookstore. And the idea is, is we want to, instead of having a, a smorgasbord of books that have been donated that we may or may not think are particularly good, is to actually have books, a certain number of titles that we think are particularly good, recommendable books that maybe you might want to even go so far as to own. I know we live in an age where people don't buy and read books, but that's a mistake because there are really good books out there that will encourage you in your faith. The best book of all, the book, the Bible, um, which you should have. Hopefully you've got that. Um, but then uh, what, what we've done is so there's about 10 titles in there right now. And we'll probably add and subtract and whatnot as time goes on. But I wanted to show you, I'm sure you can see this. But uh, I think in each case we have about five copies of each book. Got them on a little display so that you can see what the book title is. There's one book in the mix that says Loner. So you can check that out just as if it was a library book and sign your name, take it home, bring it back. The other books are for sale, and uh, we're not making any profit. We did round up, so we're technically making a few pennies. But um, 
it's just to get recoup the cost but in the front of that book there's a little tag a little piece of paper like it has the title it has the author it has the price of the book so you take that you stick it in an envelope put in an IOU hopefully you actually put cash or a check um, and you stick that in the box you can also give Online, We have instructions in there, so if you wanted to use your smartphone and, and get on and, and pay for it that way, um, you'd be able to do it. But the idea is we're just trying to encourage you to, to pick up some very good books and, uh, and spend some time filling your mind and heart with, uh, with, with better things. Uh, there's so many things that are just encroaching into your brain at all times, and, uh, and we need some good stuff to fight back with. So that is... Uh, That is what I want to recommend to you, and I would recommend you stand up and greet one another.
today, I'd like to read a passage. Um, seems to be a, a chapter I go to fairly often, but it's a great chapter, so definitely check it out. Um, anyway, so it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 through 23. So it says, um, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep into Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, fr first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by, man, by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then at the coming those who belong to Christ. Let's praise him. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope.
raised, then our hope for eternal life would be for nothing. But Lord, you were raised from the dead, and therefore we can have assurance in your salvation. God, I ask that you would remind us of the hope we have in you and draw us to closer to you to live a life that honors you for the sake of your glory. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, the kids are dismissed for Grace Place. scripture reading this morning is Acts 17, 1 through 9, verses 1 through 9. Now when they had passed through Amopolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined <clears throat> Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wick wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other, uh, some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, "These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus." And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Let's pray. O oh Lord, the God of grace and truth, we just come with grateful hearts this morning, thankful for your mercy. Lord, we're thankful that you sent Jesus uh, to be our Savior so we can have forgiveness of sin and eternal life. We just lift up and pray for uh, our brothers and sisters that are suffering and sick. We just pray for healing and help from them. Many are listed in the bulletin, but we know there are other uh, ones among us that, that need your help and healing. We're also uh, thankful for missionaries. We just lift up Mark and Wendy to you this, uh, this month as our missionaries with the Mission Training International. We also just pray for this uh, Lake Charles trip, Lord, that uh, this work that's done would glorify you and that your name would be lifted up and people helped. We also uh, just are grateful for your love and mercy. We pray for our government leaders and uh, we just pray for peace in our world, especially with uh, the war in Ukraine and just pray that you protect those believers there. And we just thank you so much for your love in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> One of the many f things that I find interesting, and uh, indeed I will waste time doing, are, are, there, are any of you engaged in any time wasters like YouTube or, you know? I don't know what you follow, but the things that usually get me are golf videos and uh, little, little documentaries about World War II especially, but warfare in general, but like a lot of times it'll be some little thing about World War II, and YouTube has figured this out. How did they know? Because they keep suggesting more and more of these things. I just keep trying to watch them all, and then they keep throwing more at me. It's really peculiar, but um, 
The other day one popped up, a little, little history that I had kind of missed out on. I knew there was a North African campaign in, in World War II, but what I didn't know was this. We, that was sort of the first time American soldiers were put on the ground to fight the Germans during World War II, and there was kind of an invasion almost like D-Day where we landed in North Africa. Never asked myself how we got to North Africa, but it was kind of a D-Day-like thing. And we thought, because North Africa had been French uh, colonized, Fran and, and so there were a lot of French people there, we thought that once we got there, the French would lay down their arms or even turn those against the Germans. Uh, turned out that didn't happen, at least not initially. Once the French realized the Americans were going to win, then they did switch sides, but not until the, some blood had been had been shed. And yeah, anyway, I found that interesting. Relates almost not at all to anything in the sermon, um, except this. Um, I, the gospel is an invasion force. That's not new information to you if you've been tracking along in the book of Acts. The, the book of Acts is about the kingdom of Jesus Christ and how that kingdom is taking ground in the world. Acts 1.8 talked about beginning in Judea. And J Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. We saw how the kingdom theme begins and ends the book of Acts. And so the whole thrust of the book of Acts from beginning to end is just this taking ground, this taking of territory. And so today we come to this where they are in a place called Thessalonica, which we might, if, you, if we wanted to think of it in military terms, we could call this the Macedonian campaign. Do you recall how they got to Macedonia? They get to Troas, you know, they're working their way on the second missionary journey and the Holy Spirit's saying not to Bithynia, not here, not there. And, and they get to Troas and then Paul has the vision of the man saying, come and help us. And they go to Macedonia by ship. They get there. They, they travel to Philippi. Of course, you know that whole story. You had Python Girl, the fortune teller. And Paul casts out the, the spirit. Things go downhill quickly. He ends up in jail. There's an earthquake. He's free. The Philippian jailer becomes a Christian. Is this all sounding familiar? Yes, yes, yes. And so um, after encouraging and strengthening the church upon their release, they hit the road and they go through these hard, hard to pronounce uh, cities, Amphipolis and Apollonia. I'll just call them that. I don't know if that's how you should really say them. But um, why did they pass through there? Why did they just zip through what looked like two good opportunities? They travel a full 60 miles on the Via Ignatia and they go through there, but they don't have any real ministry in those places. Well, the text doesn't tell us why, but I'm guessing it's because there was not a, a Jewish population in those areas. Paul's habit was always to begin when he reached a city. Athens would be the exception for other reasons, but he would always go first to the synagogue, working with the Jewish population, and then, then to the Gentile. That was, that was the way he did it. It says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, as we look at this passage, we might be tempted to think this is just another battle. When you look back at World War II, unless you're kind of a nut like, like me that likes to, you know, you're just like, yep, that was a war, and we beat the Nazis, and that's all I need to know, right? And if you're, if you're following the book of Acts, maybe you're like, yeah, Thessalonica, Philippi, I don't care. It just We just know that the gospel was advancing. But I see in this text something here that I, that I think um, it, it calls our hearts to that ongoing unrelenting commitment to the gospel. Thessalonica is just a really good example of why we ought to so love the kingdom of Christ and the gospel that we just won't quit. There should be no quit in the church. And, uh, and that's what we're going to see. The gospel of Jesus deserves our unrelenting commitment. We're like GIs, right? They've, they've, they've landed in, in North Africa. They finished off Africa pretty well. And then it's on to, on to Sicily and on beyond and all the rest of it. So uh, we're like that. We ought to be like that. And there's reasons for it. Four reasons. First of all, the gospel of Jesus is reasonable. The gospel of Jesus is reasonable. And Paul went in as was his custom, custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Um, there's something kind of basic about the three thing, uh, three times he goes into the synagogue. I don't know that, I mean, it, again, the passage doesn't exactly say why. Maybe it's just that's how it worked out. But there's some, something very biblical about three, the number three. 
You know, the two or three witnesses are what establishes a testimony in court, and it's like they have three chances, three opportunities to hear the gospel, which is reasonable. Um, but then it just comes out and it says, He reasoned with them from the scripture. He reasoned with them from the scripture. There's a lot in that, that little phrase, isn't there, in that sentence? Faith and reason are not opposites. People tend to think that way. People will even, and Hollywood loves to do this, they always make it, like if, if faith comes up at all in a Hollywood movie or TV show, tell me if I'm right about this, they always make it sound like it's the exact opposite of what you can know with your brain. Like you, you pretty much have to be brainless to have faith is kind of the way it always gets presented. But these things are not really in tension with one another. Yes, biblically we can say that faith is knowing something that you cannot see. So that much is true, that it's blind in that sense, if you will. We know also that it is a gift of God. Yet the gospel is rational, and it is received reasonably. It has to be heard. It has to be heard in words of your language. It has to be processed through the ears by the brain, and then make sense to you, and, th and, then, and then it makes its way to your heart. Remember a few chapters earlier when Paul was at Iconium? I mentioned it then. Uh, we'll look at it. At, uh, this is Acts 14.1. Now, at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue. So it sounds exactly like this at the beginning. Um, and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Do you hear that? They spoke in such a way. Now, what, is that, what does that mean? Those little... A little conglomeration of words. They spoke in such a way. It means that they spoke rationally and reasonably in, in a way for people to, to hear it and understand it. They weren't gyrating and screaming and, and, and playing on emotions or, or using some mass hypnosis or anything like that. Every time Paul is bringing the gospel, it's always put in those kinds of terms where he is speaking persuasively with reason. Look at the next verse then, which builds on this. It says, explaining and proving, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. So are you seeing this? Are you, are you getting how this all comes together? We, in verse two, we had reason. He reasoned with him. Now we have explain and proving Come to, coming to faith is not just a blind leap into the dark. It is not counterfactual. What is he doing? He's expositing the scripture. He's taking them point by point through Old Testament scripture, showing them how it makes sense, how it hangs together, how it pointed to Christ, why it would be that Jesus would have to suffer and die and be raised on the third day. He's giving them a clear picture. Isn't that more satisfying to you? Isn't, isn't that much, much better and deeper than being manipulated? As, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's, it's people being religiously manipulated. I don't want to ever be manipulated. You? I've, I've just always had an aversion to that. You know, I can remember times in my childhood, occasionally here or there, going, ending up at a church and, and just feeling like the person was just trying to emotionally get me to a certain place to manipulate me in a certain way, but not actually bringing anything for me to think about or look at. And now you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Jay, what is he? Just some kind of egg-headed, you know, nerdy kind of guy who just swims up in academia and rationality and, you know, live long and prosper and stuff like that. Is, maybe that's what you think. It, 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 nothing could be further from the truth. What I'm trying to say to you is there is something truly beautiful about the truth simply, persuasively expounded and opened in a way that our minds understand that our hearts then can embrace. Because as I read the scripture, it seems like that's the pathway. Most of the time, I know it's, maybe you come from a tradition where it's the heart first and the head second. But I don't think that's generally how it, how it actually works. And I could give you examples from my own life, but I, I want to take myself completely out of this and bring a scriptural example of this. Um, there were these two disciples. Tell me if this sounds familiar. And it's Easter, and they're walking on a road somewhere. Do you remember the name of the road? 
Emmaus. They were going their way to a place called Emmaus. And uh, all at once, Jesus joins them. Only he's disguised to them as a stranger. And he just walks along with them. And he starts telling them why they should have been quicker to believe the scripture and understand what the scriptures said about the Christ and his need to die and, 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 and be risen. And as they get to Emmaus, they're eating their, their food that evening. And he breaks the bread. And at that moment, he disappears. And they realize it's Jesus. And this is what it says. Notice the travel, head, heart, and, and, and the, how the order really goes. He Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scripture? So it wasn't like, oh, Jesus was there and I just had a really strong feeling. And then eventually he told me what it was all about. It's like Jesus was there. And he opened the scripture and he made it understandable. And that the gospel is reasonable. And that is a beautiful thing. When the scriptures are open to our minds, our hearts burned. A gospel that makes sense of sin and our longings and our doubts and our questions and shows us how it all hangs together from the beginning of the book in Genesis 1 all the way through to the end. That is a gospel that is worthy of proclaiming, that is worthy of our unrelenting commitment. The gospel of Jesus proclaims him as Christ the King. That's the second reason we should be unrelenting. If we go back to verse 3, the last half of that says, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And you that know your Bibles, you know what Christ means. Christ means anointed one. Now, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed in particular, of course, uh, and all three are true of Jesus, but this is particularly front and center would be the idea of the anointed king, the Christ, the, the, the Lord. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the Lord. He's the king of kings. He is king over our lives. One of the striking things I find in this passage is that their enemies are half right about their accusation against them. Because what are they going to say? We haven't gotten there yet, but they're going to say, these guys are preaching another king other than Caesar. And really, you know, they're not wrong. As believers, we are in, and there's different opinions on this, but I, I, I so subscribe to the idea of the two kingdom model. Because in one sense, we are supposed to be good citizens of the of the places we live, of the, of the lands in which we dwell. We're to be good citizens. We're to render to Caesar what's Caesar. We're to submit to the governing authorities. And yet at the same time, it is not untrue to say that we serve another king. And a more important king. A king that trumps all other kings. The declaration that Jesus is the Christ is a big deal. It is a big deal to call him the Christ. It's not like saying, you know what, I like anchovies on my pizza. And you like pepperoni. Eh, what difference does it make? We could get both put on, or neither one, or we can compromise and have it split down the middle. Easy peasy, right? It's not like that. No, saying that Jesus is the Christ is a declaration of war. We, we are saying that we are marching under the banner of the king of Israel. And that for that matter, he is not just the king of Israel, and he's not just the king of our hearts, but rightfully, he is the king over all the earth. We are agreeing with the scriptures that he is God's son, that he has rightful rule over every human being. He is the name above every name, the name of Jesus, at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? He's, he is the, the king before whom all kings will cast their crowns. He's the word of God through which everything was made. Nothing was made without him. To him belongs everything. Everything that exists is his. He must rule, the Bible says, until all enemies have been placed at his feet. That is, that's what we're saying when we say Jesus is Lord. Seems like such a small thing. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You can say it. It's so easy to say, but what are you saying? That's a declaration of war as far as the nations are concerned. Can you imagine what it must be like to be a Russian soldier right now going into the Ukraine? And I know we don't have a lot of pity maybe for Russia per se as a country, 
with what they've done, but just put yourself in, in the position of some poor conscript being sent into that battle and realizing how futile and ugly and sinful and wrong that war is that you've been called to. And who are you fighting for? Vladimir Putin. Yay. How would you like to be maimed or, or killed for that name? But, by this, but according to the scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, the Lord is Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we carry forth his name, his banner, his lordship over all the earth. Think back to David. You know, David's men loved David, and they were willing to do anything for David. They, they, would, they would lose their life for the sake of David. He was such a king to them. And yet, think of how fallen and, and, and uh, how shall we say, problematic David was. He was but a foreshadowing of who Christ is, the anointed Messiah, the King, the one who sits on David's throne, and he is worthy. We should never relent. We should never relent in the purposes of the gospel. Thirdly, the gospel of Jesus persuades unto salvation. Look at verse 4. More reasoning, more explaining, okay? And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So what have you got there? You've got some of the Jews in the synagogues that had heard him for those three Sabbaths. Some of them believed. And then there were devout Greeks, meaning they weren't quite Jewish yet. They hadn't made the full conversion, but they were interested in worshiping the God of Israel. And you had not a few of the leading women. And how did they become Christians? Did they buy him off? No. <laughs> Did they mesmerize them? Were they hornswoggled or duped or tricked or bamboozled? No. Paul came. He opened the scriptures. He explained it. And the outcome was they were persuaded. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The gospel is persuasive as a clear presentation of the facts. Paul reminds the Thessalonians of this in his letter to them. He's speaking as things continue to be in his life, so he's speaking in the present tense, but I think he's pointing them back to what he was and how he spoke to them when he was with them. He says there in, in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he says, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. He was successful at persuading them because, are you, wait for it, he was successful at persuading them because the gospel is persuasive. Amen. I am so glad for that, I have to tell you. I love preaching. I really do. Thank you, Matt, for preaching in my place last week. I so appreciate that as well. But you know what? I, when I get up here to preach, I feel not only the privilege of it, but I feel the weight of it because sometimes I just think I, there's just too much J in me. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, of you and you. Do you ever feel just like, I wish I could, I wish I could be a little less me? I mean, that's the preacher's dilemma because we don't want you to see so much of us that, that we would obscure or hide anything. And, 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 and you know, I can, get thing, I can be muddled. I can have horrible illustrations. I can just mess up the English language and, and all sorts of things. But here's my confidence, and that is that the gospel is persuasive. And that if we keep things simple and we lay out the scripture and we explain it and we don't try to manipulate or do it, that, that, that the gospel itself, like, like Paul says, I am persuaded or I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I can mess up a lot, but you know what? At the end of the day, it is hard for me to make the gospel unpersuasive. Church, we believe a persuasive gospel. Will everybody be won by that? Will everybody be persuaded? No. We know, we know the answer is that, that, that that will not be the case. But you know what? The gospel that was persuasive in Philippi and the gospel that was persuasive in Thessalonica and just kept going and persuading and down through the centuries, it is still persuasive today. We need to trust it. And we need to be unrelenting because it is the only gospel by which people are persuaded 
unto salvation. Okay, we are to the last reason. The last reason why the gospel of Jesus deserves our unrelenting commitment is because the gospel of Jesus challenges kingdoms. Now, I said this before, I'll, I'm going to repeat it. There is a conflict of kingdoms that is happening here, which his enemies, kind of ironically, his enemies are the quickest in a way to see it. Like they recognize that this is a clash of kingdoms. It says, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble. Um, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. So what's happening here is those Jews that did not become persuaded, they go on the attack. It says they're jealous. Now, that could be the right translation. Jealous might be what's in view there because in one sense, I think the idea that they were going to share the kingdom of Messiah with the Gentiles was kind of a non-starter for them. It's like, nope, we, we've waited all this time. That Messiah is ours. So there could have been some jealousy there. The word, however, also means zealous and angry. So I think it's not just pure jealousy, but it's, it's, it's a jealousy that's, that, that comes from a zeal and, and, and an anger of anything that challenges your religion. Like, they're not going to have this. Thems are fighting words that Paul's been speaking, and they're, they're going to they're gonna fight it with all they have. And they're not going to fight fair. In, what do they say? What's the old saying about love and war? All's fair, right? All is fair. And that's how they're, they're going to incite a riot. They essentially hire a mob. Or they, they get these guys somehow to come over. So I'm assuming they pay, probably had to pay them some money. And then they go to the house, houses of the Supreme Court and they stand outside in the street and they, wait, sorry, sorry, that's the newspaper I'm thinking of now. Um, they don't go to the Supreme Court house. They don't drag out, uh, you know, uh, Roberts. They, they go to Jason's house. Who's Jason. And the Argonauts, right? No, it's not that, Jason. There's Jason over there. Thank you, Jason. Um, no, it's, who's, who's, the answer is, I don't know who Jason is. Jason is, he's just some Christian, probably, probable Christian in the city there of Thessalonica. And they must assume that Paul and Silas and the rest are with him. So they go to his house. Have you ever noticed in the political realm, and I'm not going to get political except to say, have you ever noticed in the political realm that often the very words, and you just have to listen for it, the, the loudest accusation that one side makes against the other is typically the exact thing that they're doing. It's like if we accuse them of exactly what we're doing, then nobody will notice that we're doing that. And that's precisely what's going on here. Um, you know, they're accusing the, the, the church of starting a riot while they're starting a riot. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down and have come here also. Doesn't that sound like political discourse in America right now? And the irony is just so rich. They're turning the world upside down. They hadn't, yeah, uh, yes, in one sense, the gospel absolutely does challenge and turn the world upside down. But they didn't come in to, to, to create riot. They raise a rabble in order to ironically accuse the church of being rabble-rousers. Their tactic is brute fear and intimidation. Think of the contrast. How did Paul come into Thessalonica? Did he just raise a bunch of people to have demonstrations in the street? No, he quietly went to the synagogue three Sabbaths in a row, and he spoke plainly and rationally, convincingly, persuasively. They, in response, bring out the torches and the pitchforks. And Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. You see the clash of the kingdoms going on there? And you see how they're going for the jugular there? This is, they're going for the kill shot because what they're saying could get these people in a lot of trouble. Because first of all, they've said they're, they're causing riots. And, you know, exhibit A, we're rioting. They caused it. Um, and B, they're against Caesar because they're proclaiming a different king other than Caesar. So, yeah, they're trying to take them out. Well, they succeed at raising alarms, it says, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. Now, the good thing is, unlike Philippi, they didn't beat them on the spot, you know, strip them, beat them, throw them into deep, dark dungeon. That is a slight improvement, 
But on the other hand, there is a ton of injustice that takes place here. This, do, you, do you get that pit in your stomach when you hear about injustice? You ever have somebody tell you about something that was, that's just, it's just, it always hits you right here when you hear about something unjust. Am I the only one that feels that way? I can't tell if you, yeah? Okay. Is it, oh, oh. Well, this is, this is super unjust. They make Jason post a kind of bail. Jason and, the, and the other, some of the others. It says, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And they're like, oh, well, just, they just took some money. Do you understand what actually is going on there? They're like, hey, you Christians, you're in trouble because you're causing riots. So we're going to take some money. Give us all the money you've got. And uh, if anything more, basically the threat is if anything more happens, if these people end up burning down our city, you're going to pay for it. So you're, you're, you're putting your money on the line to make sure that they stop rioting and the city goes quietly on into the future. That, 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 that's, just, that's just so angry. And it reminds me actually of what happens on a lot of college campuses today. You sometimes have these people, generally speaking, it's, it's mostly conservatives, but there'll be, a, say, a, a Ben Shapiro kind of guy that's coming in to speak at a college campus and... Uh, um, you know, it all starts, creates a lot of turmoil, and, and, and certain people in the university get upset, and then they start rioting and protesting and picketing the administration building and making threats. And pretty soon, you know, time after time, what's happened is the administrations have folded, and they've said to the conservative group, look, unless you can pay for more security, you can't have this person come. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's the picture of injustice. How is all of this a net positive for the gospel? How is what we're saying a reason for, for being unrelenting in our support of the gospel? Well, in one sense, you might say, well, it's not, I mean, because it's persecution. And who wants to be persecuted? When Paul writes to the Thessalonians, it's very clear, uh, and I didn't pull out any specific verse because it, it's just full of it in, in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, but he, he makes it very plain. Look, you guys, when you received the gospel, you received it in the midst of adversity. This, this was a clash of kingdoms, and you guys were right in the crucible of that. Bottom line, the gospel challenges the powers that be, the status quo. But here's the deal. The violent reaction of our enemies is really proof of how transformative, how radically transformative the gospel is. See, if the gospel wasn't the power of God for salvation, if the gospel of Jesus Christ weren't challenging the very gates of hell, then it would just go by without a whimper and no one would care. They could have set up shop that day and they wouldn't have had, you know, there would have been no worry whatsoever. The reason the French and German troops hustled to the beaches when the Americans started storming the beach there in North Africa was because they knew that the enemy that was coming ashore was an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10. And that the danger was real and that, and that kingdoms were going to be toppled. We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. The gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom, against the church. And that is why we ought to give ourselves utterly and completely unrelentingly to this purpose collectively as a church individually out there in the trenches on the streets in the neighborhoods wherever we are we just rem we just need to remind ourselves of that because you're out there and, and you're kind of like i am on a sunday morning you're like i wish there were a little less of me involved here don't worry about you the gospel is persuasive put it out there let it be heard you say, but I won't tell it well enough. But that's the funny thing about the gospel. You can say it a lot of different ways. Remember at the beginning of the book of Acts, we talked about how many different ways Luke describes sharing the gospel, proclaiming the word, proclaiming the word of life. And it just, yeah, I don't have them all memorized, but there's like 30, 40 ways that he says it. And there are probably 150 ways that we can say it. But we need to say it. We need to speak it. It's worth our lives. If you don't know him, as I said earlier, I just want to be clear that we're not asking you to check your brain at the door when you hear the gospel. We're not saying, oh, you know what? You just need to forget any rational, reasonable approach and just take a giant leap of faith based on what you feel in your heart. 
No, we, we believe that the gospel is reasonable. We believe that the gospel, by the word of God, exposited Old Testament and New, clearly shows who we are, that we are sinners. It shows us our need of a Savior, and it declares and proclaims to us that a Savior has come, and he's named Jesus, and he is the Christ. He is the Son of God, the King of kings. And if you, if you surrender to him in, in repentance, in faith, if you put your trust in him, he will give you eternal life. He will bring you into his kingdom, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so worthy of every effort that we give, every moment, Lord, that we breathe and, and, and um, live. We do so for you. Um, Lord, in, in, in our resting, in our working, in our recreating, whatever we do, wherever we are, Lord, we are your ambassadors. We are your army. And Lord, we want to be faithful and unrelenting in that. Remind us, Lord, how good and reasonable and persuasive your kingdom is. And Lord, just give us the, the boldness to speak because people need to hear. People need to hear the gospel and be saved. And we pray that you would do that work. Lord, that you would let those words of the gospel fall on someone's ears today, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that he was put to death, that he was buried and rose the third day. Lord, that hearing reasonable words, that, that their heart might be warmed, might catch fire and turn in repentance and put their trust in you. We ask that you would do it for your glory's sake. Amen. Let's stand and praise him today.
humbled yourself to come to earth as a man to live the life that we could not live just to die the death that we deserve so that we may be made righteous in your sight lord let this truth humble us and fill us with love and hope for your goodness may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the holy spirit you may abound in hope amen you are dismissed, uh, unless you'd like to join us for uh, a meal here in about 20 minutes or so. That'd be 11.55 or so. <laughs>